Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and say a few things as people are making their way to their seats. We have short 10-minute slots, so I thought I'd start the introduction just a little bit early um, so that we can give everyone um, their full 10-minute slots. We're trying a slightly new format here, so everyone has uh, 10 minutes. Oh, let me... Can you... Here. That's my computer, so I could hear myself talking to myself. Um, so uh, we have 10-minute slots. So if you want to fill your, your whole 10 minutes um, with your talk, that's fine. If you want to leave a little bit for questions, that's fine, too. We do have one withdrawn. The fourth um, talk is withdrawn, so we will have a 10-minute slot there that we can ask questions in. Um, for anyone watching online, we have uh, in, the, in the Vimeo thing, there is a, a chat box, and I will be monitoring that. So feel free, um, as the speakers are talking, go ahead and drop your questions in there. And then um, when we if we have the opportunity, we can ask them at the end. Um, so I think those are kind of all of the, the technical things. Um, and with that, I'd like to welcome you all to our session on the coevolution of the geosphere and biosphere. And we're looking at early earth environments and all that that entails from um, the geochemical and mineralogical to the organic chemistry and um, the biology that goes into that, which I think is really a testament to how truly complex these systems are. And I, I love doing sessions like this because we can get this holistic uh, overview of this. So this is our last last portion of this session. Uh, we had an online session yesterday that you can go check out uh, and is available on demand online. So you can all go see that if you'd like. And without further ado, I'd like to uh, invite our first speaker to come up and that is Nicole Zellner. And I thought she was great to start us off um, because she's talking about uh, Earth's first billion years, maybe not so Hadean after all. So we look forward to hearing it, Nicole. Thank you, Shauna. Uh, so uh, we all know that lots of interesting things were happening in the first billion years, and I'm going to provide somewhat of an overview of some different scientific or reports from different scientific disciplines, and I invite us all to have a discussion about how to reconcile some of these conflicting uh, results that have been reported. Um, in particular, because I'm coming from the impact side of these investigations, um, I study lunar impact glasses to understand what the impact flux is like in the in our solar system. I'm particularly interested in what we know about that impact, impact flux and whether or not it really induced any kind of impact frustration or sterilization to the origin of life. So as a reminder, this is a summary that shows the four different scenarios that we have adopted over the last 40, 50 decades um, to try to understand what that impact flux looks like in the inner solar system, whether or not it was a smooth decline, which is what we would expect for um, planetary systems that are forming during final accretion and sweep up of planetesimals, whether or not there was something called the cataclysm, which is now known as the late heavy bombardment that may have occurred around 3.9 billion years ago and caused a bottleneck in what we think might have been the origin of life, or if it was some combination of the, of the, the two. And understanding what this impact flux is is important because of these really interesting biological and geological events that we now know were happening on the early Earth, um, including a cool early Earth with land masses and water around 4.3 to 4.4 billion years ago, uh, carbon isotopic evidence for first life around 3.9 or 3.85 billion years ago, and finally, uncontested evidence for fossils somewhere around 3.5 billion years ago. And trying to reconcile all these different data sets becomes really important for understanding the conditions of what are, that, that were occurring on our early Earth. I'd like to remind people that we have lots and lots of lunar data, both in uh, the Apollo sample collection and now the Chinese sample collection, as well as uh, orbital data from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and other spacecraft that are allowing us to have more refined and constrained measurements of the lunar surface and the samples that were collected from the surface. And on the uh, left-hand side of the screen here, you'll see the relative tentative ages that have been assigned to the largest lunar impact basins on the moon. We use the moon as a proxy for understanding the impact rate in, on the Earth because the Earth has uh, an atmosphere, plate tectonics, and water, and has erased a lot of the oldest evidence for impacts. The moon, on the other hand, preserves them. And so by this large range of ages that you can see assigned to these near-side impact basins, you can see that this idea of a lunar cataclysm wherein all of these large impact basins were proposed to have been formed in a very narrow time period probably is 
isn't the case anymore. We also now have evidence in the terrestrial record for a tailing off of impacts um, over the last uh, uh, 3.2 to 3.4 or so billion years after the solar system formed. These were um, uh, impact spheral layers that are found in some of the um, oldest terrains in South Africa and Australia that provide evidence for a decrease in bombardment that was pretty long lived and not a sharp cutoff um, as you would expect in something like a cataclysm. The GRAIL orbiting spacecraft as well measured um, now invisible impact basins on the moon, basins that we cannot see with the naked eye, uh, that were formed and then eroded over four and a half billion years of Earth-Moon system history. So this uh, spacecraft additionally provided evidence for many large degraded old basins that provide evidence for impacts prior to 3.9 billion years ago, so before that sharp spike of the proposed cataclysm would have happened. So again, here is uh, that summary of the four impact scenarios that have been proposed, and I hope I've convinced you that the idea for the cataclysm, or what's known as a late heavy bombardment in its strictest definition, um, has pretty much uh, uh, been um, replaced by uh, potentially a sawtooth pattern or something called an early intense bombardment, or if you average out that early intense bombardment, the smooth decline. And the smooth decline can actually explain the amount of high, highly siderophile elements that we see on the surface of the moon, we don't need to have it delivered all at once by something like a cataclysm. We do know that organic molecules have been delivered in prodigious amounts, particularly in the first billion years of solar system history. Uh, Chris Chiba and, and others in, in over 40 years ago proposed the delivery of organic molecules to be somewhere on the order of 10 to the 11 kilograms per year. And investigators such as um, Jennifer Blank, Ella Peterson, Zeta Martins, Vanessa McCaffrey, and myself have shown that these organic uh, molecules can actually survive impact. In particular, McCaffrey et al. showed that the uh, glycoaldehyde, which is a very simple sugar, can, deliver, can be delivered and survive impact, um, which is an important um, factor when you think about glycoaldehyde being necessary for the foremost reaction and Strecker synthesis. So organic molecules can actually survive these very high intensely, um, high pressure, high temperature impact events. So let's try to reconcile some of this evidence then, um, remembering that the uh, moon has experienced a smooth decline in impacts and that organic molecules can actually be delivered intact. Early terrestrial evidence um, reported by John Valley and others at the University of Wisconsin and other locations have shown that zircons preserve evidence of a cool early Earth in the form of land masses and water, um, potentially suggesting a hydrosphere around 4.3 billion years ago. Plate tectonics probably started very early on. There was a recent report um, by Drabin et al. that says these uh, plate tectonics were probably a global event as early as 3.8 billion years ago. And so what this means is that Earth's chemical evolution and thermal effects, not to mention the resupply and supply of organic molecules from the interior, have been largely regulated by these plate tectonics throughout most of Earth's history. Uh, one of the biggest questions that we're facing in the origin of life community is whether or not there's a reducing atmosphere and environment on Earth or whether it was oxidizing. Uh, biology prefers a reducing atmosphere, but the geological evidence shows our atmosphere was probably oxidizing as, late, as early as 3.9 billion years ago. So somehow we have to reconcile these really important competing ideas. And finally, when, when did biogenic carbon, when did biology actually occur on Earth? Elizabeth Bell and her group at UCLA reported, uh, reported evidence of the presence of biogenic carbon in a 4.1-year-old, 4.1 billion-year-old zircon. And there's been multiple studies about isotopic carbon uh, related to biology being present in sediments and some of the oldest sediments around the world. This biogenic carbon, uh, proposed biogenic carbon, has been um, uh, published by multiple different investigators in multiple different labs.
We also are starting to push back evidence for fossilized uh, biology as well. Um, some of the earliest marine um, evidence um, includes these fossilized hematite tubes that have been found in Canada with an age of around 3.8 billion years. And Tara Jokic and her group um, uh, have found uh, terasites and microbial palisade fabric, which potentially could be indicative of terrestrial life by 3.48 billion years ago. So what I've done here now is uh, showed, uh, 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 presented a slide that shows the first billion years of solar system history. In the middle is um, uh, the, the, the cataclysmic event reduced because we now think all of those 3.9 billion year old samples were coming from Imbrium, the largest impact basin on the near side. And when we start to put in um, the evidence for the biological and geological events that are happening on the Earth, regardless of what the impact flux looks like, it seems like life took a hold somewhere. And we do have that evidence um, uh, that's, that's been uh, found by other investigators. Um, so with that, on my summary slide, I will just report that based on published literature from multiple different disciplines and multiple different journals around the various fields that feed into astrobiology. It's likely that impacts were not very frequent, but they were prolonged, um, and that there was probably no impact cataclysm, and therefore no bottleneck, no impact frustration, and no sterilization of our planet. Um, it's likely we had a cool early Earth very early on in Earth's history with an oxidizing atmosphere and almost continuous delivery of organic molecules such as amino acids and simple sugars that are necessary for life as we know it. And that these simple sugars and uh, uh, amino acids and other molecules necessary for life were able to combine and form in these low temperature environments on Earth. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you, um, Nicole. And I think we have time for one. If someone has one quick question, um, if not, of course, we can save them for our for our gap. But if someone has one quick question, you can feel free to come on up. All right. We just got longer ones, so we'll save them for the. Oh no, she's coming. Okay, go ahead. About your last um, uh, impact on life the formation of, of biomolecules and life in low temperature. Um, but this doesn't, um, sorry, let me find the word. Um, this doesn't mean that um, the origins of life in the, in the ocean, in the deep ocean could happen too, right? So it really doesn't uh, um, delete that or it, it is, um, I don't think that would um, mean that the low T origin of life would be the most probable because you would have anyway this uh, deep ocean uh, volcanoes where it could happen too. Right? Sure, right. I mean, we, we talk a lot about these um, deep ocean hydrothermal vents. Um, so we think about a high temperature environment where those reducing molecules have been erupted from the interior of the Earth. But there certainly is a temperature gradient um, around those hydrothermal vents where the temperature could get cooler or does get cooler and molecules could additionally form in, um, or um, simple life could additionally form in those kinds of environments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was an awesome talk. And so next we have up uh, Monica Viduri. And so we're going to continue talking about impacts. And I'm, I'm looking forward to this one because I think this should be fun. I'm looking forward to all of them, to be clear. But um, all right, it's taking a second. Let's see. Okay. Here we go. Thank you, Monica. Take it away. It's Brittany, bitch. <laughs> What's up, y'all? I'm Monica from Sanford, and I'm going to be talking about how impact events influence the water and the atmosphere in the late Hadean and early Archean. So let's get into it. This is usually the common picture that's painted when people think about the Hadean, right? It literally comes from the word Hades, and so everybody thinks like hell, you know, volcanoes going off, the floor is lava, all that good stuff. But as Nicole was talking about in your fantastic talk, it likely wasn't like that. 
We can look at titanium and these zircons, these tiny little minerals that are about barely the width of a human hair. And these tell us that the melting temperatures of the rocks during this time period were a lot lower than we think. And so water was probably the big culprit here. And I'm not just talking about like little puddles of water. There probably could have been like oceans at this point. So this time period probably looked a little bit more something like this. Um, however, despite this image, if an alien observer was also looking for oxygen in the atmosphere, they may have concluded that the Earth was inhabitable um, because there wasn't any oxygen. But this wasn't really the case, right? Life was already in water. So. With that, let's talk about what we know for certain about this time period for sure is that there were zircons, there was already quite a bit of water, there was negligible oxygen in the atmosphere, and that's about it. And this is pretty much a, a big list of the things that we don't know. This is not an exhaustive list, but there is so, so much we don't know about this time period, yeah? The Earth has these pesky, pesky weathering processes that uh, pretty much all but get rid of the rock record during this time period. But today, um, you know, we want to fill in these missing chapters of the story, right? The story of life, our story. So what I'm going to be focusing on is the frequency of smaller impacts during this time period, as well as what was in those impactors. So this paper uh, from Archie et al. in 2021 uh, says that the smaller impacts, about 10 kilometers in diameter uh, and less, were about 10 times more frequent than pre uh, previously believed. And the title says the late Archean, but this was proposed throughout the entire um, Archean. The reducing material from these impactors could have helped to keep oxygen low um, during the Archean. So even if oxygen processes were occurring, um, these impact material, this impact material could have suppressed that oxygen. So we want to investigate this further. So let's look at what was in the impactor. So this is our Enstitichondrite impactor. Um, these are inner solar system objects which were formed in the solar nebula. These are high in iron, so pretty reducing, but they also brought a little bit of water. And they are very similar in isotope composition to the crust and the mantle. And so the EH just means high iron, the EL means low iron. But even if you look at the low iron case, these are still pretty reduced. So uh, the model that we use is called Freak C. It's an aqueous uh, geochemistry model uh, provided by the USGS, so it is free to use if you're interested in. Um, and we're gonna use this to calculate the composition and the pH of the water in equilibrium with a post-impact atmosphere. So first, we're gonna give the model some spicy water, and next, we're gonna put a post-impact atmosphere that we took from Zanli et al. in 2020. We're gonna use two bars of CO2. This paper considers two and 50 bars. Um, we've also did a bunch of runs with other different levels of CO2, but I'm only gonna show y'all some of the two bar stuff. So we have three different sizes of impactors that we looked at, and this is the pH of uh, it, the post-impact atmosphere and the spicy water that we used. Um, these are the masses of the different uh, impactor sizes that we used. The South Pole Icon impactor is definitely closer in size to these smaller impactors that we're looking at um, for this time period, but we also took a look at some other sizes as well to look at what the pH was doing. And it's a little, it's a little surprising, right? Because our, our water that we initially put in was a pH of six um, because there was more carbon going on in this atmosphere so the water would have been a little bit more acidic. But our results here seem pretty basic, especially for those larger size impactors um, and at the cooler temperatures, which is really, really interesting. Something that we're also doing in conjunction with this, um, again, these results are like kind of messy at this point, but uh, if anyone wants to talk about them, it's kind of just quite literally an Excel sheet of all these rows of the different uh, minerals that are precipitating in the water. But we also used a mineral approximation of an enstatite chondrite impactor in our freak sea model. Uh, my advisor was kind enough to share uh, some of the info from her paper that lists out all the major species of these impactors. And we equilibrated it with our post-impact atmosphere as well as our rainwater. So we also did that as well. Again, I'm not really gonna be showing you here, but if anyone wants to discuss that, I'm absolutely happy to. So then we're also gonna take all these things, equilibrate it over various volumes of water, various temperatures, various CO2 concentrations, all that good stuff. And some emerging results that we have, which are gonna come very soon, is that these highly reduced smaller impacts, which again, are maybe possibly, you know, 10 times more frequent than we thought, could have possibly worked to suppress these oxidation efforts and subsequently oxygen as a biosignature. So it could be that these impacts could act as a potential sink of oxygen during this time period. But for now, we're just gonna look at what the water pH means. So it results, the water is not as spicy as we thought. These larger impacts are probably destroying more CO2, which is going to leave behind a higher pH. Um, but why is pH really important in this case? So a lot of weathering reactions are pH dependent. It's, these, it's because of these weathering reactions that we don't have a lot of, you know, concrete physical evidence of this time period. So reaction rates for, take for example, pyrite, tend to be a little bit slower under basic condition. And so these weathering and oxidation reactions might be slower after larger impacts. So then what's that going to mean for oxygen? growth in the context of more frequent, smaller impacts. 
But of course, like I was saying, there's more stuff to test, right? Levels of CO2, different temperatures. Um, we are also going to be looking at the angle of impacts as well as kind of the spray from the ejecta that could have made it harder for photosynthetic organisms to you know, do their job. But here are my main takeaways for y'all. The late Hadean, early Archean impacts were tiny but mighty, and they could have brought a lot of reducing power to the ancient hydrosphere. And so we want to ask the questions, are these impactors biosignature suppressants? And then how did these impactors influence weathering reactions? The hydrosphere is going to be the key to filling in these missing chapters of our story, right? We're astrobiologists. We always follow the water. And specifically, um, the hydrosphere will be the key to thinking about how oxygen arose. So later on in the very late Archean at the start of the Great Oxidation event. We could really benefit from a time machine if anyone's working on that. It's really, really hard. Again, it's really hard to overstate um, how much little physical evidence we had, but for right now, we're going to work with that. And if you're a field work person, please get me more Hadean zircons. I'd really appreciate it. And with that, can't really <laughs> with that, thank you all so much. If I have uh, time for questions, I would love to take them. And thank you all to the conveners as well. Do you have time um, for a question? So please come on up to the mic if you have a question. I would also just like to make a formal request that we include more Brittany in <laughs> our presentations. Please. So next time I have high expectations of everyone. So yes, we have a question here. Hi, name's Matt. I'm also from Stanford. I think you know me. I uh, think so. <laughs> uh, so actually, so uh, you mentioned uh, the sort of the late, sort of roughly around the Great Oxidation event. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what the impact rates at that time are estimated to be and whether yeah. or not this could be a source of oxygen suppressants before the Great Oxidation event? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so it's not really known what the impactor rates were during this time period. It's definitely believed that as the Archean, and specifically the Archean went on through time, that the impactor rates decreased and decreased. We don't really know by like the factor or like, you know, what was happening there. Um, but overall, the impactors were definitely less frequent as you get later on into the Archean. Um, but again, the issue is, you know, how frequent and what were the sizes of these impactors, you know, all that good stuff. So yeah. It's still still not really well known. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, I was wondering, how do you think when they're so small and so, you know, how do you figure out um, what was going on there? I think that's a really tough problem. Um, so let's thank uh, Monica again. And next up, we're staying in the Archean and we have uh, Nathan Yee uh, from Rutgers coming to talk to us about uh, anoxic photochemical uh, reactions and pyrite in the Archean. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Shana. See okay, so I'm gonna present a, a paper entitled Anoxic Photochemical Weathering of Pyrite on Archean Continents. Uh, Postdoc Ji Wa Hao and PhD student Winnie Liu were co-first authors of this paper. So our research is motivated by our interest in the biology of sulfur. Sulfur is an essential element of all living things. It's found in the amino acids cysteine and in methionine. And in these amino acids, sulfur plays numerous critical biological functions, including the maintenance of redox homeostasis, the formation of disulfide bonds and protein structure and cross-linking, the binding of metal cofactors, and electron transfer reactions in metabolism. So cysteine and methionine are synthesized inside the cell via assimilatory sulfate reduction. So all living things have, not all, all three domains of life have evolved biological pathways to assimilate dissolved sulfate in the environment and incorporate it into the cell for the synthesis of these two amino acids. So, cis, so sulfate is imported into the cell via uh, very specific membrane-bound transporters and is activated to adenosine phosphosulfate, which is then converted to phosphoadenosine phosphosulfate, then reduced via sulfite to hydrogen sulfide, which is then incorporated into amino acids via the action of cysteine synthase. So our uh, interest is understanding the sources of sulfate on the early earth. So pyrite is the most abundant uh, sulfide mineral in the earth's crust and the principal source of sulfur to the geosphere. And our hypothesis is that the chemical breakdown of pyrite and the production of sulfate on the early earth was mediated by photochemical reactions with dissolved ferrous iron in ferruginous waters. 
Because the Earth had an ozone-free stratosphere at this time, ultraviolet light could penetrate through the atmosphere and interact with dissolved ferrous iron in surface waters. This is a high quantum yield reaction where ferrous iron is photo-oxidized to ferric iron. This ferric iron could then in turn react with pyritic sulfur to oxidize uh, sulfide minerals to form sulfate. Sulfate production in river sediments could then be transported to the oceans where sulfate was assimilated by the biosphere. This chemical reaction also produces lots of acid and releases ferrous iron from the pyrite structure which could then be re-oxidized to continually, continually sustain this reaction. So to test this photochemical weathering hypothesis, we constructed an experimental setup where we placed a UV lamp in the center surrounded by six UV transparent quartz uh, reaction vessels. We suspended crushed pyrite grains in deoxygenated solutions of ferrous chloride. We capped and crimped these reaction vessels purged with nitrogen and conducted all these experiments under strict anoxic conditions. We turned on the light and then we sampled the headspace for change to observe changes in the gas phase, sampled the aqueous phase, as well as the solids phase to, to track the mineral transformation reactions. And this is what we observed. In our dark control experiments, we observed no change in sulfate over time and no change in pH over time. But when we turned on the lamp, we saw an enormous amount of sulfate being formed, up to two millimolars of, of sulfate in aqueous solution after a couple of weeks. And this was concurrent to acidification of the waters. To test the geologic significance of this reaction, we repeated the experiments with this Archean rock sample. This is a 2.65 year old uh, pyritic shale collected from uh, the Arroyo Formation in Western Australia. We crushed the top two thirds of this sample, which contained pyrite nodules at the top, and finally disseminated uh, pyrite grains uh, in, the, in the black shale. And we observed the same thing. In the dark controls, there was no sulfate production, no change in pH. When we irradiated this pyrite suspension, we produced sulfate concurrent to a decrease in solution pH. We also tracked the mobilization and release of transition metals, and shown here is the copper data. So in the dark controls, there was no release of copper from either the pyrite experiment or the Archean shale experiment. But in both these experiments, when we irradiated uh, the samples with ultraviolet light, we saw large amounts of copper being released in, this, in the aqueous phase. Um, and we think this might have been a, uh, an important reaction for uh, the release of transition metals relevant to biology in the early oceans. So uh, my former postdoc, Jiyo Hao, who's now a faculty member uh, in the University of Science and Technology uh, of China, constructed a photogeochemical model to test how much sulfate could have been formed uh, by this photochemical weathering mechanism. So what he found was that sulfate production increased over time as the continents formed throughout the uh, Archean Eon. This is the, the dash blue line shows the uh, estimated amount of sulfate production during a riverine weathering. This envelope represents the uncertainty in this calculation and there was large uncertainties associated with the physical uh, crustal erosion rates and pyrite transport times. But we think that this uh, photochemical weathering mechanism could have produced as much uh, sulfate as volcanic outgassing. Okay, so to quickly summarize, three things. Uh, one is ultraviolet light can chemically break down pyrite. Two, this reaction doesn't require any atmospheric oxygen. And three, the amount of land exposed to sunlight could have been a major factor contributing the amount of sulfate delivered to the early oceans. For that, I thank the NASA Astro NASA Astrobiology Institute and the NASA Exobiology Program for funding, as well as the National Science Foundation. Thank you. We definitely need to have. Um, maybe we have some. Oh, there we go. Um, we have some time for questions, so go ahead.
Sean Tomical with Cold Wind, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, does this process also work regardless of the source of the iron oxides? In other words, if it was iron oxidizing bacteria producing them, would this, would this process still work more or less the same way? Right, so I think your question is, could uh, microorganisms oxidize ferrous iron to ferric iron, and would this ferric iron still chemically react uh, with the pyrite? And that's definitely yes. So um, one thing I should mention is that these reactions, as mentioned in an earlier talk, is strongly dependent on pH. So uh, we know in the modern uh, sulfur cycle that under uh, acidic conditions, um, there are iron oxidizing bacteria that oxidize ferrous iron to ferric iron that drive this chemical process. But those uh, cumulithotrophs are aerobes, so they actually need oxygen for the respiration to catalyze that reaction. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Awesome. So, you know, I want to ask about Mars, of course. So, what do you think? Um, what do you think is going on in terms of, is this possibly how we're getting so much of the iron three plus on the surface? Do you think this is playing a role there? Um, and, you know, we're seeing a lot of sulfate. You know, what do you, do you have anything to say about Well, the, Mars? the large amount of sulfate minerals on Mars is very intriguing. Mm -hmm. And I definitely think that uh, photochemical reactions played a role in sulfate formation, mm -hmm. either through the direct action of ultraviolet light with volcanic sulfur dioxide to disproportionate that, that sulfur dioxide to form the sulfate, but also potentially through an indirect mechanism where if light uh, photooxidizes uh, ferrous iron to ferric iron, then that ferric iron will chemically react with either elemental sulfur or sulfide to produce sulfate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think you have another question, Bob. Yeah, thanks, Nathan. That's really interesting. Earlier this afternoon, Ariel Anbar gave a beautiful talk on revisiting the whiff of oxygen idea. Um, it seems like there's a lot of evidence that there were uh, some, some, something analogous to oxygen, um, certainly some kind of um, electron acceptor. And I wonder whether sulfate um, that you described might actually be this, this whiff that they're seeing. If it's, um, you know, if you're talking about extremely low levels of O2, there would have been a lot of sulfate around. And that seems like a much more logical um, electron acceptance. Right, so um, this paper uh, has gone through peer review as science advances and we got similar questions. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to report that the manuscript was finally accepted for publication last week. Um, uh, what I wanna say is that this does not replace oxygen-driven um, pyrite weathering. It's a complementary mechanism and I think uh, both could have been at play in the late Archean. Um, though I do think this reaction may have played a bigger role prior to the evolution of oxygenic photosynthesis. Uh, what we did do with Ariel Anbar's uh, recent Science Advances paper was uh, we took the um, estimates of this low O2 um, constraint uh, that they discovered and tried to calculate how much sulfate could have been produced using this low O2 condition. And we think that um, in order to reconcile with the geologic evidence, there, sh there, there must have been additional oxidants to weather pyrite in addition to, to oxygen at, at, at that, uh, during the Archean. And we think ferric iron uh, from these photochemical sources is a very attractive candidate. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you. So now we're in our slot um, that has uh, our, our withdrawn talk. So we have um, you know, about eight minutes to ask any questions you have. So if you guys just want to line up at the microphones, we can do that. And we'll start with, um, I have a couple of questions online. And anyone who's listening online, feel free to keep dropping those questions in. Um, so we actually have two questions for Nicole. So maybe if you just want to come up to the podium, that then the online participants can hear you. Um, so the first question was um, from Maggie Thompson, and they ask, um, what are your thoughts on the ways in which we can try to determine if Earth's early atmosphere was reducing or oxidizing? For example, are there particular experiments or modeling work that would be helpful? 
So I think um, some of the the modeling that Monica described, I think, is is a good way to start that. We do know that there have been multiple impacts from enstatichondrites, comets, other kinds of asteroids, and really understanding how that um, reaction of the impact entry temperature velocity, the breakup of the materials, how that could affect um, any any kind of atmosphere that 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 existed um, under various uh, compositional uh, ranges, I guess, uh, from fully reducing to fully oxidizing. Um, the terrestrial samples, zircons, um, other, other materials that had been investigated suggest that um, Earth's mantle was oxidizing. And, and if that material is coming up from, um, fr from the surface and then be being incorporated into our atmosphere, that's, that's one um, component that, that should be investigated a little bit more more closely, I think, too. Awesome. And then we have another question for you. Um, and this is from Ricardo uh, Cabrera. And he asks, uh, given that the moon received a huge amount of impactors, it should have been supplied with organics, too. Is there any evidence on that? Is Jamie in the room? So that, that's a, a really, really interesting question, and it turns out that the abundance of organics that have been investigated in the lunar soil samples from Apollo um, is negligible, um, and that's because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere to protect the surface from um, any uh, radiation, cosmic rays, uh, solar wind, all of that. So organic um, materials are not well preserved, if at all, in, in the, the soil and the regolith that we've measured so far. Awesome. Thank you so much. And those are our online questions. So if anyone else has a question that they would at, like to ask any three of our speakers or a preemptive question for someone coming up, that's fine. Go ahead. Uh, actually, based on the last question, um, so a lot of worlds in the outer solar system are kind of reddish because of these tholins, which are organic compounds, yet those are on often on worlds that have no atmosphere. So how do they survive and those organics on the moon not? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, certainly, I believe um, I don't know. Uh I, I don't know that anyone's looked for tholins in the lunar regolith. Um, for for one thing, um, and I don't know the chemical reaction to create a tholin for another. So I'm I don't have an answer to that. Um, so uh, Steely Andrew Steele has has commented online and said that there is graphite and graphite whiskers in lunar samples. Just FYI. Right. Sure. Um, and he also says these are the first uh, discrete carbon phases described on the Apollo samples. Yeah. So he would know. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Steely. Um, and, and then we have another question here. Yes, please. Yeah, it, it's one for Nathan. Um, my, my understanding is people who model the ocean think that there were vanishingly low amounts of sulfate in the Archean Ocean. How does the model of the photo? Are you getting are you getting more than those low estimates with the modeling, or or, or comparable, or less? Hello. Um, so there's been estimates of how much sulfate were in the Archean oceans based on sulfur isotope measurements. Right. Uh, so people have tried to calibrate uh, using the sulfur isotope measurements to a concentration scale. And we think there's about a thousand times less sulfate in the Archean oceans than there are in today's oceans. So around 30 micromolar. Um, so uh, even with that, that amount, uh, there's still some controversy about the sources of that sulfate, uh, that concentration of sulfate, and whether or not volcanic outgassing could be the sole contributor to, to the uh, sulfate sources. One interesting observation by Ava Stukin is that it looks like in the Neo-Archean, the, the last part of the Archean Eon, there was more and more um, uh, sulfur detected in sedimentary rocks. Um, so there's been a, there was a rise in this, the, the sulfate inventory in the oceans at that time. And various uh, people have invoked different uh, ideas to explain why there was this increase in sulfate delivery to the oceans at that time. One was uh, the rise of atmospheric oxygen, and another is the evolution of life on land to promote uh, weathering. And uh, what we think was an important factor was just the fact that there was more land, and the fact that there was more land exposed to sunlight could potentially explain why there was a rise in sulfate concentrations in the oceans at that time. 
I, I can't remember the numbers on your graph, but did you, did you get to modern levels of sulfur in, in, in the ocean in, in the modeling at, at 3.2 or so, or were right. you still way, way short? Right, so, so we think there were uh, micromolar ranges of sulfate in the oceans in the Archean. My experiments showed that there was millimolar concentrations of sulfate produced by this reaction. Thank you. Um, awesome. Do we have any other questions? We have um, probably time for one or two more. We've got three minutes until our next speaker. And if not, you can all take a break and have a sip of water. I think that's okay. <laughs> Just want to wait for two minutes. Just, yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I have a question. I is it <laughs> working there? Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, the gentleman in green from Stanford, right? You had a question. I think I might have an answer for it. So one of the things um, that I like to do is try to reconcile all these different data sets. And so this is a, a slide that um, I've shown in various publications that shows the entire four and a half billion year history of the Earth and the Moon, with some exceptions. Um, so the curves that you see are actually the impact fluxes that we've interpreted from impact glasses, lunar impact breaches, lunar meteorites, and the asteroid meteorites. And then superimposed on there are some of these biological and geological events, including that great oxidation event that you asked about. Um, and so you, you can see here that impacts, as inferred from the lunar and asteroidal meteorite inventory, um, were much reduced in that 3.5 to 2.0 billion year range um, where the GOE um, appears to, to happen. Um, so this... Um, this representation, I think, sort of reflects what um, Monica described, um, that if impacts are actually suppressing oxy oxygenation, when you don't have impacts, you're going to start getting oxygen. Awesome. So we can talk about it later. Okay, well, I just wanted to put that out there. Oh, okay. Awesome, and we are right at 3.40, um, so I think we can go ahead and start with our next speaker, and that is Bob Hazen from the Carnegie Institution for Science, and he's going to be talking to us. Oh, sorry, I clicked the wrong button. He's gonna be talking to us about rare elements in surface sites and rock-forming minerals. Sorry about that. And here we go in the Hadean. So thank you, Bob. Thank you so much, Shauna. And all the work I'm going to be describing was done in collaboration with Shauna at the Carnegie Institution. Um, so I, I'm really excited about talking about aspects of mineralogical diversity in the Hadean era. Um, and I have three sort of major points that mineral surfaces, as we all know, interact strongly with organic molecules. And one solution to problem of where some of these interactions occurred has to do with trace of minor elements in rare minerals. And finally, that we're going to show that Hadean mineralogy may have been much more diverse than some of the previous estimates. Um, so we know minerals played essential roles in the origin of life. They catalyzed reactions, uh, they acted scaffolding, they selected and concentrated molecules on surfaces, they were reactants, they were containers. And a lot of the work that's been described recently has um, invoked minerals in various ways, and some of them have invoked rather rare minerals, uh, particularly the work of Steve Benner and his group, fascinating work that talks about borates and molybdenates, uh, some phosphorus compounds. I'm really sorry that uh, Tom Orlando wasn't here to talk about that, because I think there would have been uh, some overlap with what we're doing. And we, in the last few years, have published lists of what we think might have been plausible Hadean minerals, revising those lists in various ways. And what we see is that the commonest minerals that are invoked, sulfides and clay minerals and carbonates, are certainly there. But certain other minerals, like borates and molybdates, would have been vanishingly rare. <laughs> 
And so one solution to this problem is the idea of using trace and minor elements basically as dopants in common rock forming minerals. And I think that this was, uh, there are many, many papers that sort of explore aspects of this. There was a beautiful paper this morning by Rachel Speets who showed um, that a small amounts of nickel in pyrite can greatly enhance the metabolic rates of methanogens. So that type of discovery, I think, points to the role of dopants. And here's our idea. The scores of trace and minor elements are ubiquitous in the commonest rock forming minerals. And I'll also talk about the mineral diversity later on in this talk. So here is a table from a paper that's just come out. Um, and I'm happy to share this with you if you want. What we did is we looked at some of those rare elements that don't form a, a volumetrically very many minerals at all. Yet they're present in the crust in significant amounts. And if you look at the commonest rock forming minerals, olivine, pyroxene, feldspar, you'll see orders of magnitude increase in some cases in the concentration in these minerals that were ubiquitous, for example, in ocean floor basalts. And, and so even though you may not have a mineral that specifically has nickel or vanadium or copper as a major element, still these elements would have been available abundantly in various surfaces for kinds of reactions that we see have been used in prebiotic models. So our conclusion for the first part of this talk is that these potentially important minerals, while they're not replaced, represented by common minerals, they are certainly widely available in rock forming minerals all across Earth's surface. Now, you might ask, I asked myself, how can I miss this obvious point? And the answer really lies in the definition of mineral species. So what I want to do is describe a new way of thinking about minerals and mineral kinds. The IMA, International Mineralogical Association, defines minerals as naturally occurring crystals. They have an idealized end-member composition. They have an idealized structure. Any combination that's unique of that structure and end-member composition is a species. There are about 5,700, almost 5,800 mineral species today. And what the IMA is doing is basically a very efficient system that uses the absolute minimum amount of information to distinguish one mineral from another. But the fundamental aspect of all minerals is they're incredibly information rich. They have trace and minor elements, they have isotopes, defects, inclusions, all sorts of other things that tell the history of each individual sample, and we want to embrace that. So what we do in our new system of mineralogy is we split some IMA species into several natural kinds, we lump other species into one natural kind, and we also recognize amorphous materials which are not treated by the IMA system. And what this means is that in some cases like pyrite, there can be many natural kinds, more than 20 in the case of pyrite. Some are high temperature, some are low temperature, some are biotic, some are abiotic, and so forth. But in other cases like tourmaline, where IMA recognizes more than 35 different species of tourmaline, in, in one of these crystals, you can have seven different IMA species in a single crystal because of zoning. We say, no, that's just one natural kind, and there's probably only two or three natural kinds of tourmaline altogether. And we also embrace, as I said, amorphous materials, volcanic glasses, and other sorts of amorphous materials that in some cases, for example, the lunar, uh, the, the Martian uh, regolith, this is really important. 50% or more of most Martian soils are amorphous materials, and you can't really understand the evolution of Mars without understanding those amorphous materials. So we've begun an evolutionary system in mineralogy. We use a binomial nomenclature where we have a mineral like graphite linked to its formational environment. For example, the type two supernova. Here is AGB moissanite, AGB stars in which moissanite forms. We use network graphs uh, helped by our colleague Anurud Prabhu in which we have two different kinds of nodes. Some nodes represent formational environments some nodes represent mineral species, and every link then is a binomial natural kind of a mineral. So here's the first network. We can expand that to include solar condensates and CAIs. Here's interstellar clouds. We can expand it going on. These are the primary chondrial minerals, those igneous minerals in the early solar system. The different alteration products impact aqueous thermal alteration products. We see the network expanding and expanding. Our model for earliest Hedean mineralogy came in part six of the evolutionary system, which is now in press. You'll notice that there is the original network that I showed you of the stellar minerals. It's still embedded in this larger expanding network. We also think that this network is a reasonable 
model of Martian, uh, yeah, Martian mineralogy today. Um, that's something that's a testable hypothesis, but it looks like Mars got about this far. And fast forwarding to our network of all 5,700 minerals, more than 60 different ways of forming those minerals, forming a network which reveals all sorts of indications about how minerals diversified through time and reveals that by the mid hedean certainly by the end of the Hedean, there probably were 2,000 mineral species. So many, many more minerals to play around with in your prebiotic chemistry. I wanted to make just a couple of conclusions. One of them that was very dramatic is at least 80% of minerals on Earth, maybe it's as much as 90% depending on how you count, depend on water. They would not form without water-rock interactions. Biology also is incredibly important on Earth for mineral diversification. Fully half of all minerals on Earth can form through biological processes, and a third of minerals on Earth form exclusively through biological processes. So our conclusions, mineral-molecule interactions, of course, played key roles in life's origin, and we can use the trace and minor elements in common rock-forming minerals to help catalyze some of those reactions. A lot of experiments need to be done to test these ideas. And then the evolutionary system in mineralogy is pointing out that Earth's mineralogy diversified much earlier than previously suggested. And finally, I just want to make this comment about, you know, we think about, is, is life a deterministic process? Well, this realization that these common rock forming minerals host rich diversities of reactive surfaces, almost any kind of reactive site you might want occurs on some prebiotic mineral, that this leads to a support of the idea of a robust deterministic prebiotic chemical milieu. With that, I want to thank my funding agencies, thank Shauna again for the great collaborations we've been having, and maybe we'll have time for a question, I don't know. I put, packed a lot of stuff in. <laughs> yeah, we absolutely do have time for a question, so go ahead. Hi there, Bob. Great talk. Thanks. Uh, Harry from CU Boulder. I'm wondering, given the absence of these rare element minerals, do you think the other minerals would have been even more enriched in these rare dopants? What we see in the rock forming minerals is they always have these rare elements in them to some extent. Pyroxene always concentrates the, the other transition elements, for example. And certainly, if they were not being swallowed up by other rare minerals, it might be greater. But I should make the point, cobalt, for example, if you take all the cobalt minerals on Earth and look at their volume, it's one fifty millionth of the amount of cobalt that's in basalt. So there's a lot of basalt, and so there's a lot of cobalt, even though it's a trace element. Got it, thanks. And I think we have time for one more. Fine, I guess it's pretty quick. Uh, Matt from Stanford again. Um, so based on what you were saying, so it seems like there was fewer minerals in the distant, distant past, and we've gained more over time. Is it, so in the future, there should be new minerals that don't exist today. Can you theoretically predict what they might be? Yes, we've been doing this in a field called mineral ecology, which is which another whole talk is a lot of fun. Also, of course, there's the anthropogenic signal. And in terms of mineral-like compounds, there are literally hundreds of, of minerals that human mining, human engineering, human waste dumps are forming, and those will be a permanent part of the geological record for many hundreds of millions of years in, in cases. Laser crystals, things like that, they just go into waste dumps. And, and so, indeed, the diversification is increasing at an ever uh, more rapid rate. And then there's one quick question online that shouldn't take too long, and that's from Jen Glass, and she asks, is the chemical speciation of the minor elements in the major rock-forming minerals the necessary form for prebiotic chemistry, e.g. previous theories about oxidizing of them? Hi, Jen. Thanks for that question. And indeed, we think that there are many, many different speciations of these rare elements in rock-forming minerals. There are different kinds of surface sites. There's different kinds of oxidation states and virtually any configuration you can imagine that you want any kind of complexation on the surface or even dissolution and forming some kind of aqueous species, um, we, we think that this provides a very robust, so, so pick your favorite oxidation state, pick your favorite configuration and you probably can have it if you want it. Thank you, Bob. Let's give Bob a hand.
And up next, we have one of our two invited speakers. And of course, that's Raj Dasgupta from Rice University. And he's going to be talking to us about the origin of life essential uh, volatile elements on Earth. Thank you, Raj. Uh, thanks, Shona, for the invitation. So here I'll be talking about uh, the origin of life essential volatile elements on Earth. Uh, this is a collaborative work that uh, we have been doing with our former student Daman Grewal, Bernard Marty, and undergrad student Taylor Huff, high school student uh, Alexander Farnell. And this is part of the Clever Planets uh, initiative that was funded by NASA Astrobiology Institute called CAN8. Um, and we are based out of Rice University. So uh, this is not a news to the audience here. Uh, all organisms are built from the same six essential elements uh, or elemental ingredients, and they are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Um, actually, 98% or more than 98% of all organisms are built out of these um, key elements. And especially if you look at carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen, they are the true building blocks of um, nucleotide, the base, and the, and the sugar, and everything, right? So the question is, uh, what supplies these key life essential elements at the surface environment of rocky planets? Um, although these are the key elements um, that are needed for making life at the surface of rocky planets, their availability at the surface really relies on the permission from the interior of our planet. These key gases are the key elements available for life actually are available uh, by the permission of the mantle uh, because volcanic degassing releases these elements to the surface uh, for Earth, and as you have already heard, probably some sort of a plate tectonic cycle started as early as 3.8 or 4 billion years ago. So these uh, cycles can also sequester these elements into the interior. So in order to understand how we have these elements at the surface, we truly need to be understanding how we have these elements uh, in the bulk silicate earth of our planet, meaning the surface reservoirs, the atmosphere, as well as the silicate reservoirs that are in constant communication over millions of years and billions of years, right? So what we are interested in in this talk is figuring out what's the origin of some of these key life essential volatile elements in the bulk silicate earth, meaning the surface inventories, the atmosphere, um, and the silicate mantle, meaning everything in our planet minus the core, which is the metallic portion of our planet. And actually, uh, one of the recent studies uh, by Gard Gaillard and uh, others uh, that I'm showing here argued that elements such as nitrogen, carbon, and hydrogen, their surficial abundance, inclu including their atmospheric um, partial pressures, could have been actually um, established as early right after the moon forming impact by magma ocean degassing. So meaning at that period of our planet, the planet was mostly molten and the degassing of that silicate, molten silicate, could supply all these elements into the surface. So the question is, um, how did the magma ocean or that final silicate mass of our planet right before the magma ocean crystallization acquired these key elements? Um, Actually, interestingly, all of these elements are heavily depleted in our planet. So if you compare with the nominal building blocks such as chondrite, you will see that um, uh, bulk silicate earth is severely depleted in elements such as carbon and nitrogen. And specifically speaking, nitrogen is heavily depleted uh, compared to carbon and sulfur and so on. Um, so what this suggests, especially the not only just the absolute depletion, but the relative depletion with respect to chondrite, it suggests that post-differentiation, meaning post core formation, post-atmosphere formation, addition of chondritic meteorites cannot actually explain the abundance or the relative abundances of these key life essential elements such as carbon and nitrogen and sulfur because they are not in chondritic proportion. So what we want to do uh, quickly in this talk, because we don't have a lot of time, instead of talking about all the key life essential volatile elements, we are going to take lessons from nitrogen. And I am just going to quickly go through snippets from two recent studies that we did in our group. Uh, one is about the source of nitrogen, meaning where did the nitrogen from for the silicate and the surficial earth potentially come from, and what was the processes and the timing of establishing that nitrogen budget for the bulk silicate earth that eventually uh, gave uh, supply of nitrogen to the surface. Uh, so as I said, chondritic material addition cannot really explain nitrogen or carbon to nitrogen uh, relative abundances because they are not in chondritic proportions. But one interesting thing to realize is if you look at the entire history right from the onset of solar system formation, 
The differentiation process, meaning separation of metals and silicates and formation of proto-atmosphere, started very, very early. Not just in a large planet like ours, but that type of process started through um, uh, radioactive decay of aluminum-26, supplying heat. So melting and differentiation of protoplanetary bodies started very, very early within sort of uh, less than a million year of the formation of the solar system. So when we are going to think about building blocks of Earth-like planet, we shouldn't be thinking only about this undifferentiated meteorite delivery, but delivery of all these life essential elements through addition of differentiated objects, through protoplanets, through planetary embryos, and so on. So with that framework in mind, what we did in this study uh, in 2021 that came out in, uh, came out in Nature Astronomy, we looked at iron meteorites. And the reason we looked at iron meteorites uh, are for three reasons. One, um, iron meteorite parent bodies are some of the earliest formed protoplanets that underwent differentiation. Protoplanetary differentiation for these type of bodies happened as early as 0.3 million year within the formation of the solar system. Nitrogen or these volatile elements are well preserved in irons, unlike uh, alteration induced changes that can happen in silicate type of meteorites, uh, irons are much more refractory in that sense. And not only that, through um, studies of nucleosynthetic anomalies of many different elements such as nickel, tungsten, molybdenum, ruthenium, we know iron meteorite parent body differentiation took place both in the outer solar system as well as in the inner solar system. So perhaps outside the orbit of Jupiter as well as inside the orbit of Jupiter. So what Daman study showed in this um, 2021 study is when we plot these nucleosynthetic anomalies for other elements along with nitrogen isotopic compositions, um, bulk silicate earth actually plots smack in the middle of inner solar system flavored iron meteorites and outer solar system flavored iron meteorites in all of these different isotopic spaces. So what this suggests that the inner solar system regions where rocky planets like our formed already had nitrogen and not only that, that nitrogen had a distinct nitrogen isotopic flavor compared to that of the outer solar system regions. So with that nitrogen isotope mass balance what we could show that bulk silicate Earth's nitrogen isotope composition actually required nitrogen contribution both from the inner solar system region as well as from the outer solar system region. So that's kind of the first take home message. The second thing we wanted to study is whether or not you can establish the nitrogen budget of the bulk silicate Earth through some sort of a protoplanetary building processes. So in this, we needed to have two kind of experimental data sets that I'm not going into in detail. One is the solubility of nitrogen when the planet was largely molten, meaning how much nitrogen you could dissolve from an overlying nitrogen bearing atmosphere into the silicate magma ocean. And the other was if core formation was going ongoing, meaning silicate differentiation and metal differentiation was ongoing, Going, how much nitrogen actually partitioned between the metallic core that eventually segregated and the silicate outer envelope. Um, so the two key things to remember in this context is, of course, nitrogen is highly atmophile, and that's why it's, we call it a volatile element. But on top of that, nitrogen is also siderophile. So at high pressure, when you don't have a vapor phase, and when nitrogen is allowed to only partition between the molten silicate and molten metal, nitrogen would prefer to go to the molten metal phase. So with that type of data set that we generated over a range of oxygen partial pressure, pressure, temperature, um, melt compositions and everything, we eventually uh, set up to set out to do a, a mass balance calculations within three reservoirs, meaning the proto-atmosphere, um, the magma ocean, and the, and, the, and the metallic core. And what, um, so these are the equations outlining that, meaning nitrogen mass in the atmosphere, nitrogen mass in the magma ocean, nitrogen mass in the core, equals to the total nitrogen. Um, we can con calculate the concentration of nitrogen by you know, dividing the mass of nitrogen divided by the total mass of a given reservoir. And then we can calculate also the silicate nitrogen concentration from the solubility law that varies as a function of oxygen fugacity and so on. So what these plots are showing is what would be the percentage of nitrogen in the proto-atmosphere or in the magma ocean or in the core as a function of oxygen fugacity of protoplanetary differentiation uh, for different size bodies. Different curves are for different size bodies. So the main thing you should pay attention to, if you look at most of the solar system bodies that underwent differentiation, including uh, rocky planets, uh, iron meteorite parent bodies, uralite parent bodies, and so on, they are thought to be occurring at relatively oxidized conditions with respect to this iron oustite buffer that is sitting at zero here. Uh, at that type of protoplanetary differentiation conditions, 
magma ocean or the silicate reservoir will not be able to retain almost any nitrogen because nitrogen will mostly be in the atmosphere. However, um, depending on the size of the body, especially if the size of the body that is undergoing differentiation is relatively large, meaning like a Mars uh, sized embryo type of planetary systems, you will be able to retain a significant fraction of the initial nitrogen budget into the metallic core. And again, this is because of that siderophile element behavior of nitrogen. Uh, in fact, this, this uh, figure kind of uh, builds on that. So if you calculate the percentage of nitrogen in the magma ocean, again, this is relatively low if the body that is undergoing differentiation is relatively small, meaning the ox nitrogen partial pressure in the atmosphere is small. You, do you don't manage to retain that atmosphere, nitrogen-bearing atmosphere, because the planet is, is small. However, if the planet is big, meaning if it uh, grew really, really quickly, and then underwent differentiation, you will be able to retain some in the magma ocean. But more importantly, if the planet underwent inst instantaneation, very, very rapid accretion, then that nitrogen siderophile behavior comes in and you'll be able to retain a lot of nitrogen in the core of those bodies. Um, and in fact, if you do that way, that if you build planet like ours, Earth-like planet, by, um, by uh, building Earth by making, amalgamating relatively large side protoplanetary embryos like Mars-sized planets, then you can get to the present-day bulk silicate Earth nitrogen budget by amalgamating. So if you are making Mars to Earth, meaning if you are accreting a bunch of Mars-sized planets to eventually make Earth, you can get to the nitrogen abundance of the bulk silicate Earth. You can do the similar thing if you make go from the Moon to the Mars and Earth-sized bodies. But if you only make an Earth-like planet by amalgamating very, very small planetary uh, protoplanet, protoplanetary systems, then the nitrogen budget of that bulk silicate earth would have been much, much lower. So accretion of planetary embryo-sized bodies taking place within the time scale of aluminum 26 decay that gives rise to this nitrogen fractionation would be able to supply nitrogen budget of our earth. So in summary, rocky planets forming region of the solar system had life essential volatile elements such as nitrogen within one million year of the solar system formation. Um, the bulk silicate earth sourced nitrogen both from the inner and the outer solar system uh, regions. So not only did it to rely on sort of uh, delivery of outer solar system objects by planetary migrations, you didn't need that. And rapidly grown differentiated protoplanets could supply Earth's nitrogen in inventory. So although this session is about this geosphere-biosphere um, connection, and what the message from this talk is that um, the geosphere could supply this life essential nitrogen by acquiring a particular planetary building style which managed to give nitrogen very, very early, it also has implications for some exoplanetary systems. What that says is you don't need necessarily planetary dynamics bringing volatile rich materials from the outer solar systems of any other exoplanetary systems to have life essential volatile elements as such as nitrogen. Uh, the inner regions that are hot can still have volatile elements because some of these volatile elements are siderophile, so the planets as they are growing can hold on to these uh, life essential uh, volatile elements, even though they are forming in a hotter portion of the disk uh, in the inner regions of the planet, uh, close to, closer to the star. With that, I'll stop. Thanks. Thank you so much, Raj. That was an awesome talk. Um, so we have a question online uh, that I will ask. Um, so Ben Johnson says that in a couple of the plots showing nitrogen and metal isotopes, a couple of them had Earth um, not right in between the inner and outer solar system field. Could you elaborate on that? Um, yes, so I think the question is about these two plots. Actually, they do appear right in the middle when you are looking at y-axis, meaning nitrogen isotope-wise, they are still intermediate. What you are seeing is on x-axis, they are not, and just because some of these elements like molybdenum and ruthenium, uh, they are calcophile and siderophile. So they got added or they fractionated um, at different stages of planet formation. So if these elements are delivered early, they will go all, 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 the, all the way to the core. On the other hand, things like um, tungsten, calcium, and other nucleosynthetic anomalies, they are not siderophile elements. So for some of these systems, on, on the x-axis, BSE may not plot exactly in the middle, but that's not really the point here. It's really the y-axis spread, where the nitrogen isotope BSE is always smack in the middle. Awesome. Thank you so much, Raj. And let's give him another round of applause. And next we have uh, Sukrit Ranjan, who is currently hailing from 
Northwestern, although I think we may have some congratulations in, in the next step coming up soon. And today he is going to uh, talk to us about sulfite concentrations in, in early waters on Earth. So take it away. Thanks very much. Thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to be here. My name is Sukrit. I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow at Northwestern. And today I'm excited to tell you about some of our work trying to understand the nature and speciation of sulfur on early Earth and what that might mean for origins of life chemistry. Just to take a step back and kind of establish the motivation, what, I, what we're really interested in helping understand is how a dead planet gave rise to a living one. Specifically, we're really interested in understanding sulfur on, on early Earth prior to the origin of life. What kinds of sulfur, what species of sulfur were available? What environments were they available in? And what concentrations approximately were available? Oh, this has an earlier version of my talk, such as life. Anyhow, uh, for this version of my talk, I'll say uh, the key takeaway messages from my talk is that sulfite was a prebiotic reagent, specifically in shallow terrestrial waters in early Earth. And this is matters because including sulfide in models of prebiotic chemistry enables dramatic advances. The specific idea that we kind of set out to explore is the atmosphere as a source of sulfur for origins of life chemistry, specifically to terrestrial waters, systems like shallow ponds. The idea is that on early Earth as today, uh, volcanoes would have been the main sources of sulfur to the ocean atmosphere system. That's a, to the surface atmosphere system. Unlike modern Earth, there was very little oxygen, so the lifetime of that sulfur should have been significantly higher, particularly in aqueous solution. And so we explored the idea that you might have been able to establish Henry equilibrium with the atmosphere. Consequently, you dissolve that sulfur, it speciates, and then it gives rise to these so-called sulfur-bearing anions. And the kind of point that we tried to make is that if you model, if you kind of do the simplistic model, if you assume the atmosphere sets what's going on in terrestrial waters, you overall find that this mechanism can't give you very much reduced sulfur species, it can't give you much, very much sulfide, but it can give you a great deal of sulfite. Sulfur in the plus four oxidation state, HSO3 minus, SO3 two minus. Uh, specifically, we argue that you could have had more than micromolar concentrations of this compound, and in the largest uh, explosions, uh, volcanic explosions, you could have approached near millimolar concentrations. Why do you care about this? We care about this because if you try to fold that sulfite into experimental studies of origins of life chemistry, particularly towards the RNA world, it produces dramatic advances. Specifically, it turns out that sulfite enables HCN homologation chemistry that has been invoked for uh, in a systems chemistry approach to synthesis of various ribonucleotides, uh, lipid precursors, amino acids, and so forth. Sulfite also underlies the only known uh, pathway for the potentially prebiotic synthesis of all four ribonucleotides. And it's also been proposed as a solution to a problem uh, that uh, Nicole identified for us at the beginning of the session. How do you access reducing power on, an, on a mostly oxidizing early earth? Maybe you can get that by photolyzing that sulfite and giving off a solvated electron. So because it seems like sulfite might be really productive for prebiotic chemistry, we really wanted to go back to our calculation, do it more carefully, and really ask how much of it could have been there and was it, where was it really available? So to do this, we built a kinetic model balancing the sources of sulfur in the, uh, ultimately from volcanism mediated by the atmosphere and the sinks of sulfur, the things that destroy it. We particularly focused on this process over here, disproportionation, where sulfite molecules get together and exchange electrons, ultimately making more reduced and more oxidized forms of sulfur. This has been previously proposed as the main sink mechanism for uh, sulfur on an axic Earth. There's a little problem with modeling this, unfortunately, which is that the rate constants, for the uh, estimates for how fast this reaction goes in the literature vary by more than 100, a uh, factor of 100. The literature estimates span two weeks to greater than five years. And in fact, if you check the, liter the deep literature, you find that disagreements about this go back uh, slightly over two centuries. Uh, and so we set out to tr try to do our part in trying to resolve this debate to some degree. And by we, I really need to give extensive credit to my experimental collaborators who are Colette Abdulazim, Karina Kufner, and Gabriela Lozano, who did most of the actual measurements I'll be sharing next. Uh, these are preliminary results, so please take them with a big grain of salt. We are, we are still doing ex follow-up experiments to make sure they're right. Anyhow, so what did we do? Uh, our ex experimental objective was to differentiate between an anoxic room temperature sulfite lifetime of greater than a year versus a couple of weeks. To do this, we took solutions of um, sulfite, we put them in airtight cuvettes, we monitored them non-destructively with UV vis spectroscopy, and at the end of our nine-month experiments, we did solution analytics to see what had happened to that sulfite. 
Key experimental concerns included O2 exclusion. If you have O2, it'll kill this. It'll really robustly oxidize that sulfide very, very quickly. And the long experimental timescales. This summarizes the UV-Vis monitoring results of an initial nine-month pilot study we did. This is a busy set of plonks, so let me walk you through it. The top row all represents raw, uh, raw uh, extinction measured from our uv spectrometer. The bottom row represents the fractional change relative to day zero. More purple colors, colors correspond to earlier in the experiment. More red colors correspond to later in the experiment. The leftmost column gives you the entire spectrum that was measured, but both the short wavelengths are useless because they're saturated. The long wavelengths are useless because you have no signal. What matters is the middle wavelengths, which are zoomed into the middle column. This is the linear regime where you have some useful information. And then the uh, rightmost column zooms in specifically at 260 nanometers and looks at the evolution of that extinction. And we see that over a time scale of about eight and a half months, the uh, total absorption only changed by about 40%, indicating a lifetime, naively indicating a lifetime for, of sulfite of years. To check this, we then did solution analytics. We found that indeed after about nine months, only about half of the sulfite had been lost. Interestingly, it had been converted almost entirely into sulfate, into oxidized sulfur. Uh, this is a little bit unexpected because and if disproportionation is happening, we would have expected to find uh, reduced forms of sulfur as well, such as this thiosulfate, sulfide, elemental sulfur, but we didn't find any of those. What we interpret this to mean is that sulfide disproportionation is even slower than implied here. What we're seeing here is actually direct oxidation of the sulfur by O2 leaking in through our normally airtight cuvettes. And we did another couple of quick experiments that seemed to confirm this. Since then, we've launched a longer term series of experiments, ultimately started late last year, exploring a range of initial sulfide concentrations, initial pH, and background compositions. And the results of all of them are roughly the same. Um, this is the same type of plot I showed you earlier, just for one of our experimental runs. Um, here, the, uh, after about seven and a half months, the degree of sulfite loss is even less, only about 10%. And we think that's because we did a much better job excluding O2 this time. So this is consistent with a very long sulfite lifetime. Does this mean that sulfite lifetime is, go is gonna really accumulate to higher co high concentrations? We don't think so because of another process that we think is relevant, which is UV photolysis. We know that there was a lot of UV on early Earth, as we've heard earlier in this session. It turns out sulfite really efficiently absorbs that UV and it's photolyzed by it, ultimately going to sulfate. And so that will provide an upper limit on the sulfite concentrations. Uh, the preliminary results of our, like very, very preliminary results, we haven't done anywhere near the sophistication we want yet, indicates that sulfite remains high in some shallow ponds, but again, it's not able to reach high concentrations in others, specifically in ponds with high rates of seepage or in deep waters, like marine waters. To summarize the key takeaways, I, we argue that sulfite was a prebiotic reagent, but uh, in some shallow uh, terrestrial waters on early Earth, with ultimately derived from dissolution of volcanogenic SO2. Uh, and this is based ultimately on uh, experiments we've been doing, which seem to show that room temperature sulfide disproportionation is slow. Uh, over, overall, the sulfide is really interesting because it turns out it enables really diverse uh, prebiotic chemistries, particularly towards the origin of RNA. And we want to do further laboratory measurements to uh, advance, both to refine kind of the kinetics of this process and ideally to look for uh, S4 proxies in the rock record. I don't know how to do the last bit, so if any of you do, please get in touch. I'd like to thank my colleagues and collaborators and um, funding sources, and I'd love to take questions. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you for that awesome talk. Do we have a question? Is this someone? Nope. Oh, wow. was... All right. Does anyone have a question? If not, we are a little bit behind, so um, we could move on to our next speaker. And if you have questions for Super, please find him after or or email. So thank you so much. Very cool work. Up next, we have Everett Schock from ASU, and he is going to be, let's see if it will come up for us. Hi, he's going to be talking about um, the release of energy through organic synthesis. Good afternoon. It's really a pleasure to be here. First time I've been to a meeting in 27 months, probably like many of the rest of you. Uh, it's very exciting times. I have an optimistic message today to go along with that enthusiasm I have for being back at a meeting. Um, this uh, work is part of uh, the Exploring Ocean Worlds program. 
Um, you can also, as I will explain later, you too can do all of these sorts of calculations by visiting the worm portal. So the a lot of the transformations we're interested in uh, throughout perhaps many people in this audience are various uh, transformations from like inorganic to organic, simple to complex, abiotic to biotic transitions, geochemistry to biochemistry, the theme of this sort of session. And what I'm going to try to show you is that all of these transitions can be accompanied by the release of energy. Now, it's not true that I tore this out of Bob Hazen's freshman chemistry notebook, but this is an idea that's well established that if you go from uh, reactants to products, there's an associated energy change. If that is a spontaneous reaction, we talk about the Gibbs energy change of that reaction, the higher energy state to lower energy state. In between, we have all the kinetic difficulties of how to get from one state to the other. But the point of this is any sort of uh, spontaneous process associated with this lowering of the Gibbs energy. And that's what I'm talking about today. An initial set of circumstances or compositions over there where it says substrate and then the products at a lower energy state. And so what I'm going to show you is how that's possible for uh, that organic synthesis happens, can happen this way, and that uh, even uh, biological processes can operate in this same way. The point here is that we have many cases where the products are more stable in a thermodynamic sense than the reactants. So the initial challenge faced by uh, practically everything we do, is reducing CO2. Um, and of course, life does this really well. Life continues to do this on a planetary scale on Earth. That's like life's job. So right now, of course, we are surrounded by plenty of photosynthesis, where that process driven by light involves CO2 and water to produce organic compounds and oxygen. But continuously and pre uh, preceding photosynthesis are the chemosynthetic reactions where you have CO2 being reduced to organic compounds. And I'm using hydrogen here to keep track of the reductant in, uh, reductants involved to make organic compounds from CO2. And the reductants are in the rocks. And so this is how we're connecting the geosphere to the biosphere. Um, what's involved, of course, is the transfer of electrons. On the left is a uh, plot um, of hydrogen production during late stages of serpentinization at essentially ambient conditions. And it depends on what exactly are the minerals that are being produced in terms of the amount of hydrogen that is produced. But serpentinization, as widely discussed at this meeting and elsewhere, is a great way to liberate hydrogen or uh, electrons. So of course, the electrons have the Ha that has to be accompanied by the ability of the ferrous iron to actually, in the rocks, to actually get oxidized to ferric iron. Um, and so the, these processes have to be coupled, which all comes down to the mineralogy that can form during the alteration. And this has uh, gone into in great detail in the figure from the paper on the right, showing the in different units, hydro hydrogen productivity uh, related to different rock types, um, and on the right side of uh, the, the upper left, uh, the middle plot there, you would have ultramafic rocks, peridotites, and going from right to left, peridotites, uh, chromatiites, picrites, and basalts in terms of magnesium number. And so you can see that the real big hydrogen uh, production capability is in the ultramafic rocks. And what's involved is the, where the iron ends up, which minerals are stable, and that's in how the uh, hydrogen is liberated. And this is the, the release of electrons that are essential to the reduction of CO2. There we go. We're inventorying that again as hydrogen. So here's a process that biology does, methanogenesis. Again, there's our hydrogen. Think of that hydrogen as being connected to the reactions happening in the rock. There's the necessity of disequilibrium if you're going to make a living by being a methanogen. You have to live in an environment where you have CO2 and hydrogen in greater abundance than methane, so that if you make methane, you get paid to do it. Um, we keep track of that with this thermodynamic property called the affinity there, that's at A sub R. Um, and what it is, all it comes down to is a comparison of what the equilibrium state is versus what are the conditions in a natural environment. So the equilibrium state is involved in that equilibrium constant K, and the Q term is where we tie into the natural environment. So 
affin when affinities are positive, that means that energy can be released if the reaction is to proceed from left to right as written. And on the right are a couple of examples from a recent paper where uh, we show the energy supply for this uh, process from mixing of hydrothermal fluids uh, released in uh, submarine systems at present, so based on uh, measured data from a uh, basalt-hosted system there, Endeavor, and an ultramafic-hosted system, Rainbow. And as those fluids mix, there's, there's greater and greater potential for energy to be released, to be released uh, through methanogenesis, which helps explain why methanogens thrive in the vicinity of submarine hydrothermal systems. Okay. Let's make this a little bit more comp complex. I was saying we can, we can go from inorganic to organic and from simple to complex. So let's consider something like an amino acid uh, synthesis. Here we're going from CO2 to ammonia. And once again, our friend hydrogen, think, again, think of that as the connection to the reactions happening in the rocks, producing alanine and a whole bunch of water. Um, you, again, this kind of process involves a link to those electrons released by a water rock alteration. And the question is, can, th can there be positive affinities associated with these kinds of reactions? Now, we want to compare a whole bunch of these because uh, there's a bunch of amino acids we might be interested in. One way of keeping track of this is to uh, account for the average oxidation state of carbon in these compounds. It's just a charge balance thing. It's just arithmetic to work this out. Um, but here's how amino acids plot in terms of the average oxidation state of carbon in amino acids. Um, they, they, all of the protein-forming amino acids span the range of plus one to minus one in average oxidation state. You'll see several that are fairly oxidized. They're indicated with blue in this and the following figures. Some that are right around zero, um, indicated by black in the uh, uh, upcoming figures, and then the ones where the carbon is more reduced, um, indicated by red in the upcoming figures. So here is a plot, again, for that same sort of mixing between a submarine hydrothermal uh, fluid and seawater. As those two fluids mix, there is increasing, below about 200 degrees, there is increasingly positive uh, affinity for many of the amino acid synthesis reactions, those overall uh, reaction. So the, this is a kind of situation then where the organic synthesis you might be interested in, there is energy release associated with that organic synthesis process. That means the organic compounds are more stable than the inorganic mixture of stuff that happens spontaneously as hot water pours into cold seawater. Now, there are many other kinds of processes on the earth where various uh, disequilibria can be generated. I'm using this hydrothermal mixing example uh, today because it's one I'm particularly familiar with. But I want to make this point that even on our heavily oxidant polluted world, because of all that photosynthesis going on out there, this process remains in these kinds of environments at the bottom of our ocean right now, an energy releasing process. Let's ask a methanogen. Here's some baby pictures of Methanocaldococcus yanashii, one of the uh, types of methanogens living around submarine hydrothermal systems. It's an autotrophic methanogen. It uses CO2 and hydrogen to make methane. It also uses CO2 and hydrogen to make all of its organic compounds, all of its biomolecules. So we take the genome of Methanocaldococcus yanashii, convert it over into all the protein sequences, and when we do so, we get 1,787 proteins. Um, and here's just one example of an overall reaction to produce this protein. This is what this organism does. It takes in CO2, ammonia, sulfur, and a whole boatload of hydrogen, again, Remember, that hydrogen is our link to the rocks. It's the water-rock reaction that is really, that's written where the iron is being oxidized, the water is being reduced to hydrogen, and you get a rather astonishing stoichiometric reaction coefficient on that hydrogen, and there's the composition of the protein. We don't usually think of protein synthesis this way, but if we were to ask our buddy MJ about it, MJ would say, yeah, that's what I have to do. I start with CO2. I've got to make this protein. 
Well, let's consider the affinities of these reactions to make these proteins. Um, once again, we're comparing equilibrium states with the conditions that are uh, available in the environment. These are the resulting affinities for producing all 1,787 of those proteins in that same mixing environment where the hydrothermal fluids from the rainbow vent field on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge mix with seawater. On the left, the data are presented in uh, affinities um, per mole of protein. Notice that the, uni the units here are megajoules, so that's some serious energy. Um, they're presented on the, on the right side um, in terms of uh, affinities per mole of amino acid in the proteins. And you'll notice this familiar now structure of the blue, black, and red colors, where the more reduced the protein is, the more energy is released by its synthesis. But the point I want to make, hopefully it's not uh, escaping here, is that all the proteins in this methanogen are more stable than the inorganic starting material uh, that in, in the surrounding environment where it lives. So, if you're thinking about uh, ways to, uh, to do organic synthesis, you're thinking about ways to build complexity, to go from inorganic to organic, to go from abiotic to biotic, and geochemistry to biochemistry, don't fight thermodynamics. You can find lots of ways in which you can get thermodynamics on your side. You can have energy release associated with all of those processes. You can then reduce your problem to mechanisms and kinetics only, he says, ha. But anyway, the point is get thermodynamics on your side. If you want to know, learn how to do all of these calculations, visit the worm portal. Uh, there's the, the link to it where all of these uh, calculations are made available to you. It's free. It's all in Jupyter Notebooks. Let's go. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Everett. Um, I think, all right, well, Nathan has a question right here. <laughs> Everett, Hi, that's Nathan. a fascinating talk. So my question to you is, do you think there are abiotic amino acids being formed today in hydrothermal vents in the sites that you're describing? And the, the extension to that question is, do you think there are abiotic proteins that are being formed in uh, these locations today? I have no idea. I know that there are abiotic uh, amino acids that have formed on uh, meteor in the meteorite record. A lot of that uh, makes a considerable sense uh, when you link it to the aqueous alteration events that occurred on meteorite parent bodies. It's also an energy releasing process in a similar way. I have a feeling that if there were abio that uh, I, I kind of doubt that there's that it would be easy to um, measure abiotic amino acids at, in a, a setting on the Earth uh, because life uh, operates faster than um, the uh, the abiotic rates. In fact, that is a principle of geobiochemistry. The things that burst into flame are not good to eat. Um, and so you, you've, biology has to beat the abiotic reactions. Um, and, and that's usually what it does. So I suspect that it would be hard to find because biology would be there uh, pounding on it. And in terms of proteins, I, I don't imagine that there would be an, a full abiotic synthesis of a protein, but there is a thermodynamic drive to, for energy to be released if that were to occur. Thank you, and I think we can do one more question and then we'll move on to the next speaker. Well, okay, let me say also, we, um, I want to move on to the next speaker just because I think we'll probably get cut off online, but we are not going to be kicked out of this room. So, um, Everett, if you don't mind sticking around and anyone else who is a speaker and if you have questions for any of our speakers, oh, you can, we can still do one more. But, um, but after that, you know, then we can all stick around and keep asking questions within the room. I just don't want the, it, us to get cut off online. So go ahead with your question. Well, I'll start by saying I enjoyed your talk and I suspect that this might be better hashed out over drinks, but I'll say Great. for this room that the ribosome will disagree with you because it takes three equivalents of NTP to put an amino acid into a protein. That's One, a kinetic problem. No, it's not a kinetic problem. It has to do with the fact that it takes energy to be accurate, it takes energy to do kinetic proofreading, and it takes energy to activate a carboxylic acid into a phospho form to get into an amine. 
Well, those all sounded like kinetic problems to me and mechanistic problems and not thermodynamic problems. This does sound like a beer conversation. <laughs> all right, so up next, we're gonna learn about uh, formation rates of ferrocyanide in the early earth. And that is going to be uh, with Zoe Todd, who's joining us from uh, the University of Washington. And here we go. Thank you, Zoe. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for sticking around. I'll try not to take too much of the poster time. Uh, so today I'm going to be telling you about formation rates of ferrocyanide on the early Earth and implications for prebiotic chemistry. So in case you haven't heard it at this conference so far, hydrogen cyanide is commonly implicated in prebiotic chemistry. It's gotten lots of shout outs in various sessions. So I'm either going to reiterate that or if you haven't heard it before, state it for the first time. So this historically dates back to orosynthesis back in the 1960s where he first determined that you can synthesize adenine. So the letter A in DNA and RNA, the A in ATP, it's all throughout biology from pentamerizing HCN. So take five HCNs, put them together, you get adenine. So that's back in history, cyanide is important. What about more recent prebiotic chemistry? Well, cyanide is still very important. Uh, so I'm going to show a variety of very um, detailed chemical schemes here. You're not supposed to understand every detail of all of them. That's not the purpose for having them here. Mainly, I just want to point out that, hey, in Steve Benner's 2020 paper describing one version of prebiotic chemistry, HCN is used as a feedstock molecule and as a source of synthesis to make biomolecules and precursors of life. HCN is not specific just to this chemistry. You can also look at the cyanosulfitic chemistry coming out of John Sutherland's lab. And again, hydrogen cyanide is the basis for this network that can make amino acids, lipids, sugars, and ribonucleotides. Finally, I'll just throw up one more. And again, this is Becker et al. 2016. Hydrogen cyanide is a source molecule, and different type of synthesis to get to the same biomolecules and precursors of life. So by now, hopefully, I have reiterated or reinstated the fact that HCN is commonly implicated in various prebiotic chemistry, and HCN makes the building blocks of life. So that's awesome, but does HCN actually exist on the early Earth? And we can ask that question, and fortunately, the answer is probably there are sources of HCN on the early Earth. So these range from things like lightning generation in the atmosphere. So you can think the classical Miller-Urey spark discharge experiment, this done in a fairly reducing atmosphere can give you quite efficient amounts of hydrogen cyanide. Similarly, UV photochemistry interacting in the atmosphere can also synthesize hydrogen cyanide. And both of those two processes are much more efficient in more reducing atmospheres, drop off in efficiency when you go to a more oxidizing atmosphere. If you want an atmosphere composition independent source of hydrogen cyanide, you could look to impact delivery or perhaps also impact sy synthesis of hydrogen cyanide. So HCN is important, and HCN could have been there through a variety of means. But there's one catch. You knew it was coming, right? It sounded too good to be true. And that is that hydrogen cyanide can degrade over time. So you can begin to see a premise of a potential issue for prebiotic chemistry. Either you have to be continuously synthesizing HCN, and it has to be continuously available, or the prebiotic chemistry that makes use of HCN has to happen on such a faster scale than the degradation occurs or you need some other geochemical source to kind of save you from this potential issue. So one potential suggestion here, and I should state, we do not know at this point how fast necessarily that chemistry works under a planetary environment. So these are open questions that we're not entirely sure about at this time. So one potential solution is that you could store hydrogen cyanide in the form of ferrocyanide. So if you have a ferrous iron center, Fe2+, you have six cyanide ligands bound to it. This becomes a much more stable form of cyanide. You can potentially store this in stockpile it for later use. So this is demonstrated in this really nice figure from Sasolov et al. 2020, where if you have HCN in the atmosphere, you can potentially concentrate that in surface waters with things like Fe2+, and we heard a lot about sulfur, and you can see sulfite appears in these lakes as well. Then if you evaporate and ultimately precipitate out some of these salts, this is a good way to potentially accumulate decent amounts of ferrocyanide and be able to use cyanide later on. And this again goes back to 1995, Keith and Miller uh, with a paper titled, Was Ferrocyanide a Prebiotic Reagent? But they investigate this primarily from a thermodynamic perspective and also with a focus on the oceans. So what I wanted to know was how fast does this chemistry work? You know, if we're thinking about kinetics, 
is this an issue or is this not an issue at all? Or what can the environment constrain about the chemistry? So we asked the question, how fast and efficiently does ferrocyanide form under a range of plausible planetary conditions? So we tested the rate of formation and the yield as a function of concentration of reactants and pH. So to show you some sets of experimental data, this is showing 0.1 millimolar of Fe2 plus and varying concentrations of cyanide at a pH of nine. So what you can see is that this reaction occurs quite fast. So if you, you see a very steep increase initially in your concentration of ferrocyanide, which is determined through UV vis absorption measurements, you can see we only have to monitor this reaction for about four minutes for it to be pretty much done. So we can determine the rate constant from that first 10 seconds and the final concentration of ferrocyanide under a range of conditions. So here, the left-hand panel is showing you K, that rate constant of initial formation, and the right-hand panel is showing you the final concentration as a function of concentration of cyanide and across a range of pHs. So a couple things stick out here, and this is primarily in the pH dependence. So this reaction is fastest and most efficient at pH 8 to 9, and it's interesting that it drops off at more acidic pHs, but also what really caught my eye is that pH 10 is not better than pH 9. You do not see this linear increase when you change the pH. So this is with varying cyanide concentrations. We can do the same set of experiments, holding cyanide constant and then varying the concentration of Fe2 plus. Again, investigate the same pH range, make similar plots, and again, we find that pH 8 to 9 are going to generally be the fastest and the most efficient, and we observe the similar behavior. So what does this mean for ferrocyanide in the planetary context? So on a planet, you can have pretty much, you know, free choice or constrained choices of concentrations, pH, and temperature, depending on what environment you're considering. And just as a reminder, hydrogen cyanide, we like it because it can synthesize biomolecules. So we can start to imagine a little model of a lake on the surface of early Earth. We have some partial pressure of hydrogen cyanide in the atmosphere, can equilibrate with surface waters through Henry Law equilibrium that we heard about earlier. Uh, and then if you have a stream coming in that contains some amount of Fe2+, which you would likely have on the early Earth before the oxygenation event, then you can form ferrocyanide and we can ask the question, all right, given our experimentally determined rates and yields, how much ferrocyanide can you possibly accumulate? So this is a preliminary calculation, and I would caution you that the numbers are very dependent on what assumptions you make. So what is the flow rate into the lake? What is the volume of the lake? What is the concentration of free ferrous iron that you're assuming? But what I do have a lot more confidence in is the change between different pHs and the trends with pH and concentration of ferrous iron. So what I'll draw your attention to here is that you really do not get a lot of ferrocyanide accumulation. I'm showing you the amount of time here to reach one millimolar of ferrocyanide, which is kind of like a thumbs up concentration for getting prebiotic chemistry to work in the laboratory. So at pH 6 and low Fe2 plus concentrations, this can take a really long time, We're talking millions of years. But if you go to more basic pHs and bump up the ferrous iron concentration, you can have this occurring plausibly on tens of thousands of years or a thousand years, or even if you're really optimistic, a hundred years, 10 years. Um, so overall conclusions, we measured these rates of formation and yields of ferrocyanide over a range of planetarily relevant pr parameters, including concentration of pH. Temperature experiments are in progress, so we will be able to add that parameter in here as well. And we find that the accumulation of ferrocyanide is favored at slightly alkaline pHs. And under these favorable conditions and with assumptions that are hopefully reasonable, but again, subject to your range of constraints for the early Earth, ferrocyanide stockpiling to significant concentrations may be able to occur on reasonable timescales for probiotic chemistry. And with that, I will thank David Catling and Nick Wogan for help and collaborations on this experiment, this project, uh, funding sources, and of course, Peter, my pony. He says hello. You'll have to bring Peter with you next time. Yeah. Um, all right, do we have a question for Zoe? Yeah, it looks like we have a couple and, and we can ask as many. And if you have questions for other people, feel free to go ahead and start lining up. I know we had one for Everett and so, yeah, go ahead. Um, how easy is to get out the, the hydrogen cyanide from the Paris? Uh, Sorry, say that again? Yes. How, how easy is to recover the HCN from... from yeah, that's a great question. So it has been suggested that you can do thermal processing. Uh, so you might need somewhat high temperatures to this. There are various references that have been cited in the literature, but I would love to see someone do that study um, 
much more thoroughly and uh, revisit that question. Uh, there's another possibility is that UV radiation of ferrocyanide can do a reaction called photoequation, where you can kick off one cyanide and put a water molecule on and then it might rapidly lose more cyanide. So it might be possible to get some amount of cyanide from that mechanism as well. Thanks for the question. Awesome, and we can come right over here. Uh, Paul Rimmer, University of Cambridge. Hello. Hi, Paul. <laughs> really nice talk. <laughs> Thank um, you. It looked to me from your plot, although it was a difficult to tell from, um, from the way that the gradients are shown, that it seems that the concentration of iron matters a lot more than the pH. It looks like if you just have a lot of iron, it works pretty quickly regardless of the pH. Would that be an accurate interpretation or does pH matter more than the way that I'm kind of looking at that? Plot? No, I agree with you there. And I think the other thing too is I'm showing you six orders of magnitude of ferrocyanide or ferrous iron concentration. So that's really a wide range of parameter space there. And your ferrous iron concentration is somewhat degenerate with the volume of the lake you're assuming in your flow rate in my preliminary, preliminary model here. So depending on those assumptions, I think the role of pH should not be understated, but again, the dominating factor is going to be those assumptions. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Awesome. Thank you. And then I think we have a question right here. I think, Everett, this might have been for you. Go ahead. You can ask your question. Hi, Jessica Bowman from Georgia Tech. Um, maybe I missed it in the beginning, but I was wondering if you could comment on your assumptions about the presence of oxygen in these uh, reactions and also on any assumptions in the prebio prebiotic deposit. Yeah. So the, yes. This is for me, not Everett. Correct. Is that true? Okay, yes. Yeah, so we did these all exclusively in an anaerobic environment. So in a glove box, oxygen free, oxygen reduced, uh, degassed water, you know, zero ppm oxygen inside the glove box. Um, if you don't do that, you, this reaction is, you know, you can't study it properly because the ferrous iron oxidizes very quickly in an oxygen environment. So you've got to be careful about that. And, you know, the early earth, we're assuming it's pretty oxygen free. So, yeah. Thank you for the question. Awesome. And let's uh, let's thank Zoe. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I think that we, we have some questions online. And if there was anyone else in the room, you guys can feel free to stand up. And I'm just going to ask the questions. And if the speakers are still here, great. If not, um, Raj, are you still here? I think this one is for you. So um, NN, I'm not exactly sure who that is, but someone NN uh, says, uh, can you comment on the observed difference of uh, nitrogen between the inner and outer solar system materials, and what's the main loss mechanism for N from a rocky protoplanet? Nitrogen, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can give you this. Um, yeah, so isotopically, I guess um, the outer solar system materials are heavier in delta 15 n, higher values. Uh, inner solar system, uh, lower delta 15 n values. Uh, so we do need certain amount of outer solar system or CC type of material as far as nitrogen isotopic composition go. As far as the loss mechanism, the majority of the loss from chondritic building blocks as they are forming uh, protoplanets would be through formation of protoatmosphere that eventually gets lost because these protoplanets are so small they cannot hold on to their onto their atmosphere because um, there is not enough gravitational pull. So that's so that differentiation and atmosphere formation and atmospheric blowout would be the dominant mechanism of losing nitrogen. Uh, at the same time, you do need to retain certain amount to make nitrogen budget ex explained in our planet. And that's why we uh, explain like relatively faster growth of some protoplanets so that nitrogen can be held on to the body and partitioned into the core and retained in the atmosphere. But the major loss mechanism is through protoplanetary atmospheric blowout. Thanks. Awesome, thank you. And I think we hit all the questions online. So thank you everyone who stuck through to the end and thank you again to all of our speakers. This was an awesome, very dynamic session. So thank you all and enjoy the rest of your app icon. <laughs>